start out meditating, you have to think. But you have to think in a skillful way. In other words, you're thinking about the breath. Directed thought, evaluation, these are factors of right concentration on the level of the first jhana. So even though you may be able to get into concentration really quickly, there's still some thinking that gets you there. And if you get into concentration slowly, you've got to learn how to think your way into the concentration. Think about the breath. Visualize the breath in the body. Think about how to make the breath more comfortable. And once it's comfortable, think about how to spread it around in different parts of your body. Think about the way you understand the breath. There are various levels to the breath. There's the in and out breath. There's the breath energy that's flowing along your blood vessels, flowing along your nerves. There can be still breath in the body. There's lots to think about. And these thoughts are all meant to help get the mind settled down. The Buddha once said that he finally, after all his years of trying false starts and going down dead alleys. When he finally got into the path is when he realized that he should divide his thoughts into two types of skillful thoughts and unskillful thoughts. In other words, you judge your thoughts by the results they give. He didn't say that all thinking was bad, although he did say that even with skillful thoughts, you can think about skillful thoughts 24 hours, and the only drawback is you get the mind tired. So you want the mind to learn how to rest from the thinking. But he never said that the conceptual mind is bad. It's just learning how to use your concepts properly. That's the, that's the path. It's the part of right view, right resolve. These involve thoughts. So we're not condemning thoughts entirely. It's just learning how to think in new ways, think in ways that are actually skillful, that help free the mind. I mean, ultimately, you do want to get to a place that's beyond concepts, that goes beyond words. But you get there by using concepts and using words. This is a point that a lot of people misunderstand. They think that in order to get to the unconceptual, what beyond concepts, you just drop concepts immediately. It's like the old simile of the raft. The version in the Buddhist teachings is that you take the raft across the river. And then once you get across the river, you don't need the raft anymore. You can put it aside. And so the thoughts of right view, the thoughts of right resolve, these are part of the raft. There's actually a Mahayana version of the, the simile where you get across the river by dropping the raft to begin with. I mean, the simile just doesn't work. If you drop the raft, you get washed away. So you learn how to use the raft. And this issue goes way back to the time of the Buddha. There's a story they tell of Ananda Bindika, who was out walking in the morning. He says, it's too early to go visit the monks. Let's go visit the other sects. And he went to a place where they were having their debates, and they were debating whether the world was eternal or the world was not eternal or finite or infinite, whether the soul was the same thing as the body, whether the soul was different from the body, whether an enlightened being existed after death or didn't exist or both or neither. Those are the hot issues of the day. And so they saw him coming and they said, oh, let's be quiet for a while. This is a follower of the Buddha. He likes quiet people. Maybe you'll think if we're quiet, he'll come in over and talk to us. So they were quiet. Then Ananda Bindaka came and they asked him, so this, this Buddha you're a student of, what are his views? And Ananda Bindaka said, I really don't know totally what his views are. What about the monks? What are their views? I don't know totally what their views are. What about you? What are your views? And he said, well, I'll be happy to tell you my views, but I'd like to hear yours first. So they tell him their views. And one man said, the world is finite, only this is true, everything else is false and worthless. Someone else said, no, the world is infinite. Only this is true. Everything else is false and worthless. And so on down the line. 
And, and the mendicant's response was, well, whoever holds to that in any of these views suffers because they're holding on to the view. And wherever there's clinging, there's bound to be suffering, and where there's suffering you just can't get there's no real happiness. And they said, well, what about your view? And he says, well, all views are conditioned. Whatever is conditioned, you have to, you have to let go of. And he said, well, that your, that your view too is, is a cause for suffering. And he said, no, this is the view that leads beyond suffering, because it teaches you of ultimately let go of views. And according to the story, they were abashed and sat with their heads drooping. And he got up and left. And when he told the Buddha what had happened. And afterward, as the Buddha said, you know, this is this is a good way to deal with those people. In other words, they had this trick question. They said, well, if you think our views are a cause for suffering, your views are a cause for suffering as well, i.e., all views must be a cause for suffering. And then another Bindika said, no, there is this one set of views that leads you away from suffering. You use it as a tool, and then you can drop it, because this kind of view helps you see beyond your attachments. And it's the same with the Buddhist teachings. People many times come to it thinking, well, we're here to get beyond concepts, but then they run into concepts in the Buddhist teachings, and therefore they feel that the Buddha is being inconsistent. What's inconsistent, though, is their misunderstanding. The Buddha never says we're, we have to drop concepts from the very beginning. He says you use concepts to get beyond concepts. You see, especially now, people come to Buddhism thinking, well, they're suffering from their conceptual framework, they're raised in a materialist worldview, and they feel alienated from, from themselves and from the world around them. And they think it's simply because of their concepts. Any kind of concept would alienate them. They come here and they see the Buddhist teachings on karma, on rebirth, and they say, this is invalid. You can't make presuppositions about these things. Nobody knows anything about what happens before we're born. Nobody knows anything about what happens after we're born. All we know is that you can be in the present moment without concepts, and that's happiness. And so that's what they want the Buddhist teachings to be. They don't realize that they're judging the Buddhist teachings by the very concepts that are making them miserable. The idea that we can't know beyond our immediate sensor experience, so therefore we just try to heighten our immediate sensor experience. The Buddha never taught that. He said you use concepts to get beyond concepts. So that's what right view is all about. It's, it's there for you to judge the concepts that you're bringing to the path, to see which ones fit into the context of right view and which ones don't. And he never says that he can prove karma, the teachings on karma, or that he can prove the teachings on rebirth. But he says, if you do adopt these things, these ideas, they're very helpful in taking you beyond suffering. In other words, it's a pragmatic proof that he offers. He looks at this, these thoughts in terms of what they do, where they lead. And if you find that they lead you to wanting to train the mind, so that you can get rid of the craving that leads on to future rebirth. Okay, they've performed their function. And then as you sit down here to meditate, then you can put them aside. And if you find that you're having trouble sticking with a meditation, you can call up those concepts again to remind yourself of why you're here, to induce a state of sangwega, a state of basada, confidence that if there's any way out, this has got to be it, training the mind learning how to watch the mind so you can see where its misunderstandings lead it to suffer, where its misunderstandings lead it to crave things that are going to cause problems on down the line. And then you use those insights to give you more impetus to practice. To realize that this is something important that we're doing here. We're not just trying to hang out in the present moment and squeeze as much intensity out of the present moment as we can. We are in the present moment to watch our intentions, and this is what the teaching of karma is all about, why the Buddha stresses karma over and over again. 
the early Buddhists often made the point that their teachings on karma were what set them apart from all the other teachings available. In other words, it's not a deterministic view that some people had at that time. And it's not a view of total chaos. It's nonlinear. And the important element is that part of your experience is shaped by past intentions, and part of it is shaped by your present intentions. You can't do anything about past intentions, but you can change your present intentions. So you focus on that. That's why we're focused on the present moment, to look at our intentions. And when you have right view, you realize that's why we're here. So that helps give focus to your meditation. Once the mind is still, and you intend to make it still, that's a skillful intention. Then you want to look at the process of intention in a deeper way to see exactly how much it shapes your present experience, how an intention happens, how, how you fabricate your breath, how you fabricate thoughts, how you fabricate feelings and perceptions. You want to look into that. That's how discernment is developed. Now, you're not going to have this kind of focus unless you have a real appreciation that, yes, your actions really are important in this issue of creating suffering. Not only now, but on into the future. So this is how the proper use of concepts gives real focus to your meditation. A while back I was giving a talk to a group of people on karma who had been meditating. They had been meditating for quite a while. I tried to make the point that you know, an understanding of karma really does focus your meditation in an important way. It helps focus you on the issue of what you're doing that's skillful and what you're doing that's not skillful, and realizing how much that does shape your experience. And they all kind of looked at me with this blank look. And I realized they'd been taught you know, there is no such thing as skillful or unskillful, good or bad in the meditation. It's just simply hanging out in the present moment and squeezing as much non-conceptual intensity out of the present moment. Which is a point that the Buddha never made. That's not what we're here for. I mean, there will be times when you notice that when you're very mindful in the present, things do become more intense. You're less caught up in your thought worlds, and the breath becomes more intense. Everything becomes more intense. But that's not why we're here. You want to look deeper. Okay, What is it about the element of intention that makes the difference in the present moment? Always look for that, because that's where freedom is going to lie, in understanding your intentions. That's when, when you totally understand them, that's when you let, can let them go. I mean, this is what they call the karma that leads to the end of karma. This is why an understanding of causality is so essential. I mean, if everything were deterministic, if this, your experience had been totally decided by some outside being or some impersonal fate a long time ago, there would be no purpose to practice. There couldn't, there's nothing you could do to practice. If everything were chaotic again, you couldn't depend on things that you would learn yesterday having an effect on what to do skillfully today. But the fact that things are nonlinear, that part of your experience is being determined by what you're choosing to focus on, what you're choosing to do and say and think right now, that leads an opening for the practice, because you can change what you intend right now. And you can try to intend more and more skillfully. So when we come to the practice, we don't totally throw away concepts. We learn to adapt and adopt new concepts that have a good impact on the mind. That's the test. It's a pragmatic test. In the beginning, you begin to see that it does help here, it does help there. And you pursue it more and more, and then you finally ultimately discover that it has a big help in putting an end into suffering. That's the point where you get beyond concepts. Even when you're in concentration, okay, once you drop direct to thought and evaluation, you still have perceptions. In fact, all the states of concentration up through the dimension of nothingness are based on a perception, the label you have in the mind. 
that keeps you in that state of stillness. Even though there's no discursive thought, there's still a concept there. So it's not a matter of totally abandoning concepts. It's learning how to use your concepts wisely, picking and choosing which ones are helpful, which ones are not. When you need to think discursively, when you can drop discursive thought and just be with one perception. That's a skill that's based on right view. So learn how to make your views right. And then apply those right views to understanding how the mind creates suffering. And that's how views ultimately take you beyond views, so that even right view is something that you can learn how to let go <laughs> when you need to. But don't be too quick to drop it. Don't be the sort of person who leaves the raft on this shore and tries to float across the river. Use the raft when it's helpful. That's why it's there.